Hey everybody, it's Rothbard's Disciple here, and I'm bringing you guys a quick video on how uh, white nationalists uh, really need to start using Bitcoin specifically for their uh, media operations. And I wanted to dispel a few myths that people have about Bitcoin, because generally speaking, most of the people involved in the white nationalist movement are very uneducated as far as Bitcoin goes. Uh, the one guy who I really liked uh, when he's talked about Bitcoin was Richard Spencer. Richard basically called the top in in the price of Bitcoin. He was telling people not to buy it when it was like at $16,000 because people weren't actually using Bitcoin for what Bitcoin was meant to be used for. Um, but even for somebody like Richard Spencer who uh, you know he said a lot of good things and he made a lot of sense when he talked about Bitcoin. I'm not sure if he understands um, the most important aspects of Bitcoin and how it can be used for white nationalists. And the, the biggest thing that people misunderstand about Bitcoin is that it's not money. Okay, that's a secondary use case of Bitcoin. It's just like if you've ever read uh, Ludwig von Mises or any of the people in the Austrian school and uh, how they say you can't use something as money unless it has a non-monetary value, okay? Um, the, the money value of Bitcoin will never be realized until it's used world worldwide, okay? It has to be accepted by people as non-money before they'll accept it as money. So everybody talks about, oh, it's uncensorable money and you can use it for payments for people within the white nationalist movements so that their payments won't be stopped and whatnot. Um, and this is this is not true at all. And it's, it's especially stupid because as of right now, for anybody to really buy anything with Bitcoin, you have to convert it over into fiat anyways. So the uncensorability of Bitcoin as money and its ability to stop people from, uh, you know, basically having their bank accounts frozen and whatnot, like none of this matters until it's used worldwide as money okay and so it's a really stupid argument that people make when they try to say oh we should use bitcoin because then we can get money and it's uncensorable that's it's not true at all um not even close to true. What Bitcoin is, is it's not money. It's a decentralized and immutable ledger of truth, okay? So that sounds a little bit weird. Um, when you say it's decentralized, it just means nobody's fully in control of it. Um, there's no one central entity that you can try and shut down to shut it down. Um, and then when I say it's an immutable ledger of truth, all this means is that you can't um, change what has happened in the past in Bitcoin um, and so because of this, uh, if you put something on a Bitcoin blockchain, it's going to be there forever. It doesn't matter how many years it takes for you to go back uh, and check something on Bitcoin. You know that the record on Bitcoin is legitimate, okay? And, and the reason why this is important is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of white nationalists are trying to say, oh, we should use Bitcoin. And you hear a lot in the media that... Bitcoin is dominated by white nationalists and Nazis. This isn't true. It's absolutely dominated by uh, SJWs, globalists, and anti-white people. Uh, people that absolutely hate white nationalists. Um, I've been through this before and I don't want to go through uh, all the examples of this again. Um, but even when you do uh, simple um, polls within the community, the liberal leaning side is far more numerous than the right leaning side. And the right leaning part of Bitcoin, they're like cosmopolitan libertarians who really, um, you know, they're, they're like Jeffrey Tucker. Let's just put it that way. It's basically Jeffrey Tucker style right wing libertarians and SJW. So white nationalists have absolutely no place um, within Bitcoin. Okay. And so b white nationalists need their own version of Bitcoin. Now, when I say this, I don't mean you just copy and paste Bitcoin, okay? So there's an inherent problem within Bitcoin that makes it so it cannot be used long term, and that's the long term 0% inflation rate. A lot of people will say, oh, this is great because it stops the usury of the modern banking system where they just print a bunch of money out of nothing and then they charge you interest on it. Well, there's there, if you have a 0% inflation rate, you actually create usury um, in, in a different way. Uh, and just so you guys know, um, I've worked, you know, this isn't like a, <laughs> a, a super. Um, important position but i've been a, a software d um, tester for um different software that's they like one of the software um testing positions i had was for um an application that won five million dollars uh in a venture capitalist um competition um i've also been an advisor to uh i was trying to create a version of bitcoin that would kill bitcoin um but I pissed off the people who I was working with. Um, and at this point, I was just an advisor because I'm, I'm right now, I'm a miner of Bitcoin. Um, and until the coin was created, my role was only advisory. And my role was actually an important advisory position um, because the people who I was advising, um, I gave them the entire idea. I approached them and said, hey, look, 
they were mining pool operators. Uh, that's who I was working with. And um, I said, look, you guys aren't making any money with your mining pool. If you try and create this coin that will start killing all the other versions of Bitcoin and Bitcoin itself, you can make a lot of money. Um, and then it fell apart because I'm a bit of a white nationalist. And uh, one of the venture capitalists who they were working with is a guy who I actually had been in close contact with for a while. He's a billionaire named Craig Wright, but uh, he's an anti-white globalist, and I basically said I couldn't stand this guy and I was going to bankrupt him, and that was a big no-no for them because they work with him a lot. And so they flaked out on the project, and so we we didn't create the project. Um, we didn't create the coin, um, which is a real sad thing. Um, but anyways, that's why I'm turning here to the white nationalists um, because uh, I, I've always thought that they should be the people who create this. It's just they have a very poor understanding of Bitcoin. Um, but again, it, because Bitcoin has zero long-term inflation, um, one, this bankrupts miners. Um, if you look at the history of Bitcoin miners and mining companies, they, they bankrupt themselves like like they're going out of style. Um, the most recent mining company, which was once a behemoth within the uh, Bitcoin community uh, that is now getting close to bankruptcy, they'll probably survive, but it's called Bitmain, um, and they were making billions of dollars per year. They were making more money than NVIDIA. Um, and then the Bitcoin market crashed, and now they're getting in entirely crushed. And, and it, the whole problem with Bitcoin's long-term 0% inflation rate um, is that it's not a market-based inflation rate. Okay, so if you're mining something like gold or silver, the amount of gold and silver that you mine is directly linked to how much uh, capital you invest in uh, in your mine. So, like, if you buy a bunch more uh, equipment and you open a bunch of new mines, you're going to get more gold and silver. With Bitcoin, it doesn't matter how much equipment is created. Uh, in order to mine the Bitcoin, uh, the amount mined is always the same. So uh, inherently, Bitcoin, it's a socialist money. And the re reason why this creates usury um, is because if you have 0% inflation, you can't have a bank charge interest. I mean, you kind of can, but the problem is, is that uh, any interest payments that you're making, uh, like if there's any growth in, in an economy, um, the interest payments that you make, uh, you'll not only have to pay them back more Bitcoin, but you, your Bitcoin is going to be worth more money later on. So you're also paying back the extra added value of the Bitcoin. Um, and, and so, like, let's say you have, you know, 3% economic growth in a year. And I'm not talking about GDP growth. I'm talking about just wealth growth overall. This means that every business who has taken out a loan is going to experience a 3% loss uh, directly equivalent to the amount of the or the size of the loan they took out. OK, and so this is a big problem. And the only way you can try and get around this is by the creation of um, the creation of bonds and the only people who can create bonds are the people who own bitcoin okay and i know this because i've had a direct conversation with craig wright he's one of the largest owners of bitcoin rumored to be satoshi nakamoto the guy who created it um it wouldn't surprise me because he's a bit of a cunt and um he's a greedy motherfucker and you wouldn't create Bitcoin with the inflation schedule that Satoshi Nakamoto did unless you were trying to uh, mine all the Bitcoin in the early years when it was really easy to do and then just sit on your ass for the rest of your life and uh, be a free rider, okay? And so the fact that the 0% inflation uh, within Bitcoin creates usury, which just again, it means that Craig Wright and his friends will be able to um, charge you interest to uh, purchase his bonds that he creates from Bitcoin or from his Bitcoin holdings. Um, the problem with this is, uh, again, you're, you're paying him for doing nothing. He just holds on to his Bitcoin and he's like, you have to pay me because I own the Bitcoin, you know, and it's it's a stupid model and it makes absolutely no sense. So um, the, the way you get around this is, uh, and I'm not going to go into the technical details of this, it's actually pretty simple. You just, uh, instead of having Bitcoin's um, block reward, which is, that's what controls its inflation rate, instead of saying that there's a quota, um, that every four years the amount of Bitcoin mined per block block uh, is halved until it eventually reaches 0% inflation, you just say, okay, the amount of uh, Bitcoin mined um, every block is dependent upon the difficulty. Now, the difficulty is just um, the, the relationship between how many miners there are on the network. So if there's more miners, um, this would mean the difficulty, like it'd get, it would get harder to... Uh, find a block within Bitcoin, and if it gets harder to find a block within Bitcoin, that would mean that the block reward would rise, okay? And this m makes it work perfectly um, in the way that gold and silver do. Uh, not perfectly, because it's a, it's a different manner, um, but it makes it uh, mimic gold and silver, and it becomes a market-based uh, inflation 
model rather than the uh, socialist um, model that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto implemented, okay? And so not only is this fi fixed uh, Bitcoin better, um, but you can actually kill other versions of Bitcoin. Um, and this is actually very interesting, and I'm not going to go fully into the details, but the reason why you can do this is... Um, there's a strategy called selfish mining within Bitcoin, and selfish mining just means uh, instead of, uh, like when you're mining on Bitcoin, instead of trying to play fairly, you instead hoard all the Bitcoins yourself and you don't participate with other members of the network. And the reason why this is important is because selfish mining only works because Bitcoin's inflation rate has nothing to do with the difficulty, okay? So you can't selfish mine. Um, you kind of can, but it's really not effective. Um, it's way less effective to selfish mine on a version of Bitcoin that has the block reward linked to difficulty, okay? And so what you do is you build up your white nationalist version, version of Bitcoin, and then you start attacking Bitcoin because your attack against Bitcoin is far more efficient than their attack against you. So by definition, you're going to win and you can kill them, okay? Now, actually implementing this attack and the strategies for, strategies for doing it are kind of complex. This is actually exactly where my um, advisory role was with the, uh, the development team that I was working with in order to create one of these coins. Um, and they f didn't fully understand the attack vector. They didn't understand how you pull it off. And this is where our problem started. I started getting on their ass because I said, look, you guys are building this like shit. Like your attack strategy will never work. You have to do what I'm telling you. Um, and it, it's not as though like I'm the only one who can understand this. It's just they uh, they just didn't understand the attack vector. And they were starting to piss me off. And then I told them, look, you know, we're going to end up killing Craig Wright and his versions of Bitcoin because he's an idiot and he's an anti-white globalist and I don't like the guy <laughs> and then that was the last straw for them. They didn't like me telling them they were stupid in terms of um, their attack strategy and then when I said I was going to bankrupt a guy who they were closely aligned with, um, they kicked me out of the project. Um, and the project basically died. Um, it could still be going on to some extent, but again, like I said, they didn't understand the attack vectors um, so they're not going to be able to um, fully implement it without me, um, unless they find somebody else who talks about these things. But as as a, as far as I know, I'm the only person in the world who talks about these things. But uh, it's it's pretty lonely over here. <laughs> but um, the other thing that's important is not only are you going to uh, kill the other versions of Bitcoin, and when you kill them, the thing that's interesting about this is um, when you kill another version of Bitcoin, it's just a display of power. So all you're doing is you're saying, or you're showing to the world, look, we're more powerful, and you, you use propaganda while you're doing this. You say, look, we're going to kill these versions of Bitcoin to prove that we're more powerful, we're more secure, and we're the only ones you can trust your money with, okay? And so it's this big display of power meant to uh, prove to the world, to anyone, you know, without a tech background, that you are the legitimate version of Bitcoin, okay? And so that's the big problem within Bitcoin right now is you have all these different clones of Bitcoin and none of them can prove that they're the legitimate version of Bitcoin, okay? And so the other thing that's really nice about uh, linking the block reward to the difficulty is that people can't clone your coin um, because since the block reward is linked to the difficulty, this means if they try and fork off your coin, if they don't have the hash rate or the miners following you uh, or onto, this, onto their fork, this means their block reward drops precipitously okay and so it solves the problem of all these uh, copies of Bitcoin because it it, it, it changes the uh, game theory structure so that anyone who tries to fork Bitcoin or just copy it um, they're gonna make substantially less money and there's nothing they can do about it okay so it fixes all these problems all in one go and it forces people like look you in order to um, try and beat our version of Bitcoin they would have to um, <coughs> build a better version Okay, and that's not, I'm, I'm not even sure if that's possible. Um, if, if I were sure it was possible, then I would be advocating for that way to build a different version of Bitcoin, okay? But again, once you link the block reward to difficulty, you've got the best version of Bitcoin. You can kill all the other coins, and nobody can try and clone your coin and create their own because it just makes, it, it makes no sense from a profit standpoint, okay? But where things get really interesting um, is the, in the uh, non-monetary use cases of Bitcoin. And this is where I was talking about before, where Bitcoin's not money. Um, it, it's a decentralized and immutable ledger of truth. And so all these non-monetary use cases of Bitcoin, um, they're solutions to problems that plague the white nationalist movement. And the number one um, non-monetary use case that I've been promoting for a very long time, and again, 
there, there are other people who are kind of promoting these non-monetary use cases that I'm talking about, uh, but there's a specific way you have to do it within Bitcoin uh, just because of the economics and the way that the uh, network is structured. So once again, I'm the only one, not only am I the only one who talks about linking the block reward to difficulty um, in order to attack all these other coins, I'm the only one who actually... Um, uh, talks about the uh, the most efficient format to use these uh, IP extraction apps, okay? And these IP extraction apps, um, basically all that they do is they ensure that your intellectual property is honored and that nobody can steal it from you, nobody can really censor you. Um, you, you kind of can censor people, and we'll get over that, or we'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, these IP extraction apps, they have no practical use for non-whites and liberals because they're not the ones who get censored, they're not the ones who have their, um, you know, accounts frozen, they can say whatever they want on Twitter, and the reason why this is actually really good is because if you're familiar with Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, um, one of the one of the most important um, and hardest things to do uh, within a political movement is to push a negative into a positive. So right now it's a real big negative that Twitter censors and bans all these conservatives. However, by doing so, they actually will push everyone towards this white nationalist um, version of Bitcoin and the applications that are put on top of it, and so. If white nationalists own this version of Bitcoin, not only have you just gained this money power, you know, and the money power is uh, its the most important power in the world besides the political power, but unlike the political power, the money power is constant, okay? So political power, it's harder to control. The money power is very easy to control. So you would control the second most important power in the world in the money power, and uh, but it would also give you control over your intellectual property. And just so you guys know, um, the most valuable commodity in the world, it's not oil, it's, it's not gold, it's not silver, um, it's, a it's actually data. Okay, so data is the most valuable commodity in the world. So not only would you own the money power, you would own you would own data um, as a whole. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, IP extraction for white nationalist media. So what, what makes some um, IP extraction work, and again, this is the structure that I've been trying to promote within the world of Bitcoin, but they're all a bunch of lefties. They hate white people. They're a bunch of globalist faggots. Um, they absolutely despise nationalism. But these guys, when they're trying to build the IP extraction apps, um, they do it wrong. And the reason why they do it wrong is because a lot of the people pushing for this are big miners within the space. And it's kind of uh, like it's very um, – or what, what they push is for people to put the data directly on the blockchain. So this would mean like if you've got a movie, which is a couple gigabytes, like your average high-def movie is around four gigabytes. They want you to put that full thing on the blockchain. Um, if you actually do the math for this, it costs about $60,000 to put a movie on the blockchain. So it makes absolutely no sense. Um, the reason why the miners want people to do this be, is because obviously if, if they're paying $60,000 to the miners in order to put one movie on there, it seems like it would be very profitable. But nobody's ever actually going to do this. Um, so what you actually need to use, um, it, they're called hashes. Now what a hash is, is it's just a way to take any sort of digital file. Let's say you've got a four gigabyte high definition movie. You run it through a hash function and it'll give you a 64 byte hash. Now the 64 byte hash um, it's like a fingerprint in that uh, if you put any order other um, digital file through the hash, it'll give you something different. And the only way to get that hash um, from, or get the only way to get this output hash is to input that that specific movie. Okay, so if you make any alteration to the movie whatsoever, the hash changes. And the reason why this is important is because it does two things. One, it allows for your lightweight verification of unbounded amounts of data. So this just means like the data that you're using, uh, you can trust the integrity of it. So you can know for a fact that um, this is the legitimate movie. It doesn't have viruses in it. It doesn't have any of these things. It's not some um, scam artist giving you, um, you know, some sort of edited version or like a, a second rate version of the movie. It's the legitimate movie. Um, uh, the second thing that it allows you to do, and, and this is within the uh, verification of it, is it allows you to check um, this movie's legitimacy against um, all of the content created by any sort of organization. So let's say you're watching like an InfoWars video, right? Not only can you check to see if the specific video you're using is legitimate, um, but, but 
you can also check the the specific video against all the other content that um, Infowars has created, and you do this through uh, something that's called Merkle roots, uh, a Merkle root or Merkle tree. Uh, it looks basically like a tournament bracket, and the reason why this is important is. Um, when you're trying to verify the legitimacy of one item against the entire set as a whole, uh, instead of verifying each item individually, you combine the items together and then you verify the combinations of these items. And so this uh, it, it scales logarithmically and that might sound sort of weird and complicated to you, but what this means is if you have one million videos uh, released by Infowars, they, they come out with a shitload of content. I don't know if they're at a million yet, but if you had a million uh, videos released by Infowars and you just wanted to check to see that this one video was legit and not only was it legitimate, but it was a legitimate video given to you by Infowars, um, then you'd have to check, in, instead of checking the, all those 1 million videos and making sure all those 1 million videos that they've released are the legitimate ones, um, y you just check the one video against 20 other hashes. If you're checking um, uh, a thousand videos, it's 10 hashes. If you're checking... Um, I think it, it, maybe it's a billion videos, uh, that's 30 hashes, a trillion videos is 40 hashes, and each hash is 64 bytes, okay, so this is smaller than a Word document, okay, so you can do this with your cell phone, okay, and so this makes it incredibly easy. All right, and so this, uh, instead of uh, having to pay, you know, $60,000 to put one movie on the blockchain, you, the 64 bytes will be a fraction of a cent to put the one movie on the blockchain, and then you can check this, uh, this movie against, uh, or in this case, we'll say it's an InfoWars video. Instead of paying $60,000 to put an InfoWars video on the blockchain, you pay a fraction of a cent, and then if you want to check um, to make sure that the video you have, again, is a legitimate InfoWars video, and you want to check it by checking it against against all the other videos that InfoWars has released. Um, instead of having to go through, like again, let's say InfoWars has a million videos, if each one of their videos was, let's say, four gigabytes, that's actually a little large, because that would mean it's a two hour video, which it probably isn't, but let's just go with that number for now. Um, that would be um, four ter or not terabytes, that'd be four petabytes uh, of, <laughs> of data, and that would take, you know, probably a couple weeks if not months for you to verify all of this information so if you use hashes it's very lightweight okay um, the other thing that you can do with hashes is uh, you don't have to trust the source you get it from because again you're trusting the file itself um, the only reason that or the only thing that you would want to trust um, is that if you're making a payment you want the payment to go to the right entity and you do this through addresses themselves um, this is uh, it's a separate thing, um, but again, these addresses they're only like they're I think a, a Bitcoin address is something like 32 bytes. I don't know exactly something like that. But so these are all very lightweight things that you can do on a cell phone. Um, but again, you you don't have to get the the file directly from Infowars. You could download the file from somewhere else in a way that you're still paying InfoWars, but InfoWars might not even know who's distributing it to you, okay? And why this is important is it means censorship's almost uh, impossible. Imagine if uh, InfoWars, uh, you know, when they got canceled from YouTube or whatever, imagine if they just started giving out their uh, videos to, to their users, and then their users started uploading these videos onto YouTube themselves, okay? How are you going to have YouTube try and stop this onslaught of people who would be uploading legitimate InfoWars videos um, it, like YouTube doesn't have the manpower to try and stop all of this, okay? They, they absolutely don't have the manpower to stop this. Um, and if you're doing something like this, this gets a little bit more complex, and so I'm not going to talk about this in too much detail. Um, because if you're if you're just uploading the same video with the same hash, YouTube can try and make it impossible to upload any video that has that hash, and then you have to actually do what's called adding salts, which just means you add you slightly um, vary the video so it has a different hash that comes out um, when you upload it, and that gets a little more complicated to make sure that Infowars is still getting the payments that they should from the ad revenue, and it it, it gets a bit complex. Um, but again, you can build this from basically nothing into something big and unstoppable, um, all using Bitcoin, your own white nationalist version of Bitcoin, okay? The other thing that's really important about this is that the immutable record keeping of the blockchain allows for what are called uh, decentralized autonomous corporations, or a DAC, uh, or a DAC,
Um, these DACs are, I'm going to call it the DAC. The DAC, um, it's really simple. All it means is that uh, you have people working together who don't even necessarily know who these other people are. Okay, so again, since you're using hashes, each person, person who would work on something or work on one aspect of a video, if we're going back to the InfoWars example, um, you could have people working for InfoWars that InfoWars doesn't even know who works for them, okay? They just know the work that these people do. And it, you do this all by sending hashes. So maybe InfoWars sends a video to an editor. Um, the editor then sends the video back to InfoWars. And you can keep track of this by each person just adding a hash to the blockchain, which, again, is just a fraction of a cent. And then by doing this, uh, you have an immutable record of who gets paid for what, okay? So I this gets really interesting because... Um, even if you like, you know, with with modern um, modern corporations, there's a lot of paperwork involved, and if you lose the paperwork, um, you can lose all your information and data that governs all these things. But if you use something like Bitcoin, let's say you make a video for Infowars before Infowars got big and before they actually had any income stream, you can still actually have contracts with Infowars. Uh, that say, hey, look, if, if we end up making money off this video, we'll give you, you know, as editor, we'll give you 10% of the profits, or maybe it's 15, whatever the contract states. Um, it, even if it takes them 10 years to make profits on this video, it's all stored on the blockchain, and so you can get paid automatically with a receipt that can never be deleted, okay? And so you don't have to, like, store a paper receipt in, in your own files or, you know, in your own... Uh, you know, in, in whatever, you don't have to store anything. It's all stored on the blockchain for you, and it's all linked to your blockchain address addresses, so it's not like they can forget how to pay you. They always have this information available for themselves, okay? So this allows owners and work workers on these hive mind DACs uh, to enter and leave the corporation at, at will. That's what makes it a hive mind DAC is that you just have a bunch of people working together. You know, the, a hive mind just means that you you know these their minds are linked, um, and they can enter and leave. And it's almost like they're this super entity because instead of instead of having these. Um, long-term relationships like in modern news organizations where you hire somebody and then they're working with you forever or for as long as they're or until you fire them I guess um, with the hive mind DAC uh, you have a bunch of people competing against each other and then it's just however um, the, the owners and workers decide to work together that's what ends up being the product okay it's just a hive mind and so you might have one editor working for a while he might get tired of it and so he might not put as much effort into this his editing and then you can just as easily replace him with a new editor okay and the, the final point here is that, or on this slide, is that the pseudonymous nature of blockchain makes protecting your identity easier. Um, there's two caveats to this, um, or th there's one main caveat to this that I want to talk about, which is uh, even though you're pseudonymous, you know that, like, if it's just one individual working on any sort of, like, if you're an editor for InfoWars, people will know. Uh, or be able to find out like that this is one editor doing this work but they won't necessarily know who it is so there the two points to that is one you're pseudonymous but you kinda have to do a little work to remain private but two if someone tries to do something abhorrent like if someone tries to upload porn or, or like child pornography onto your white nationalist version of Bitcoin uh, that's on there forever who did that okay and so they have just fucked themselves by creating a, a um, uh, an unerasable record of their crime. So, yes, it allows you to be pseudonymous, but it is, uh, it's absolutely retarded for anyone to try and do any sort of disgusting criminal act using this, okay? So, it, it gives you the best of both worlds, and it's really interesting how it allows you to do this. The next point I want to talk about is how propaganda is super profitable. Fox News profits around $1, $1 billion a year. It's got poor anchors and analysts. Um, they really do bad coverage of most things. Um, they promote the baby boomer, mentally retarded version of uh, right-wing thought. Um, so it, it's not that hard to beat them. And you've got to also understand that hive mind DACs are inherently more efficient and they can create far more content because, again, anyone can work on your content. You might actually, in a, in a hive mind DAC, like let's say you have InfoWars, uh, you know, doing their news videos, you, you might have multiple editors releasing different videos, all of which are profitable and paying different people, um, just edited differently in a different style, okay? Or you might have a bunch of different um, reporters working for InfoWars reporting the same news, but because they each, each reporter has a different style, um, they'll attract different audiences, okay? So you'll have more content. It's inherently more efficient because... Uh, 
instead of you know being stuck with one worker even if that worker starts to suck later on uh you know the the owners and workers within these hive minds they choose who they work with okay and so it's much easier to get new workers on it's much easier to get rid of poor workers and, and it just works far better than a traditional corporation the other thing too is that there's a lot of these people like video editors or people who want to be talk about the news who are willing to work for pennies okay and uh, you don't have to pay them a living wage and they'll still be willing and they'll still love doing it because that's just what they want to do and you can't do that with something like Fox News okay and so with an organization white nationalists can build up their own capital create their own news organizations and you can have people specialize you know the one thing that I see all the time right now is you try to have people doing everything themselves they try to be the editor they try to be the news gatherer they try to write their own content then they try to present it in a way that uh, an audience will want to hear it but you you don't want that in an organization uh, Fox News actually has a pretty good um, strategy for this they have very attractive women in a lot of their as a lot of their news anchors it's only if you're phenomenal as a man that you'll ever get any airtime um, but men will listen to women far more than they will listen to men. That's just the way it is. It's actually a thing within uh, the military is that they, uh, for absolutely all of the military equipment, if you have to use a voice to talk to the uh, soldiers, the voice, like a, a robotic voice, it's always a female voice. And the reason why you do this is because when within uh, violent combat men don't listen to other men that's just the way it is um, they've done a lot of studies on this the military has uh, but they will listen to a female voice and the reason why this is important is because politics is a game of violence okay so it's only if like this is the same reason why Fox News they only like if you're top of the line as a man you'll get airtime but otherwise you have to be a pretty woman because when you're talking about politics, politics is an inherently violent thing. So if you have a man talking to you and he's not necessarily that talented, a man uh, like the viewer, a male viewer is going to tune this person off, okay? But if it's an attractive woman, the the uh, male viewer will, will listen no matter what, okay? That they're just programmed to do that, okay? Cuz if you're talking if you're having a male talk and they're, you know, they're pretty good but they're not top of the line, then the male viewer just starts thinking to himself about politics and doesn't pay attention to what's going on um, on the screen. And this is why you use a woman as the, you know, I guess you call it the face of the organization, okay? And so you could have people, again, who are very attractive women like uh, Faith Goldie, Lauren Southern, Lauren Rose, um... I can't remember the name of the girl from Red Ice, Lana Lochtef. You know, they're all beautiful women, and there's a reason why you want to promote them. Uh, it's because men will listen, and men will not listen to other men in terms of politics. Like, they will if they're very good about what they're talking about, but if, if you want men to listen, um, you want to put pretty women up there on the stage. And then the men can do the other jobs, like the writers, the news gatherers. Uh, they can run the organizations. It doesn't matter. But you can have people specialize rather than forcing people to do absolutely everything themselves. Okay. The other point, too, is that uh, white nationalists, there's, an, there's a lot of disagreement within the white nationalist space. Um, anytime you had, uh, like, if you think back to European history, uh, when they actually were white nations, uh, they had a lot of disagreement. Okay. So it's not going to be repetitive and dull content if you just have white nationalists. There's a lot of um, diversity of thought. That's the one time that diversity can actually be good, is when it's diversity of thought, okay? Uh, the fourth slide that I want to talk about, and this is going to be inevitable if you create your own white nationalist news organizations, is that you will be attacked by, uh, you know, the establishment news sources, and that's actually a great thing, okay, because the attacks can only serve to legitimize you, okay? Um, all press is good press, and all it will do is give you more publicity, and it'll get more people to listen to you, and because, again, you're a hive mind DAC, uh, you don't need one distributor, you don't need one place, or we, there's not one thing that they can try and shut down to shut you down, okay? They can try and go after your uh, content creators, but even that gets kind of hard, okay? Because you can operate absolutely anyone in the or, or anywhere in the world, and if one of your distributors is, is, is taken down, another will immediately rise. If they're able to silence one uh, personality, um, you know, you can just have personalities who maybe they don't show their face, okay? And again, even in this situation, you still, like, there's a vast... Um, uh, there's there's a really uh, uh, important reason or there's a vast advantage to having women be these voices because that's what men want to listen to okay that's just a fact of life uh, there's a lot of white nationalist men who try and go out there and promote their own media 
uh, and they complain about oh the women don't have to try like that's that's the way it is okay if you don't like it quit being a bitch and start hiring women uh, in order to just either do the voice or be the be on your videos have them be the face of what you do and that's what you want okay <clears throat> And the other thing about being able to operate anywhere in the world is that something like Fox News, like they basically have to operate within America. You know, it, it's very hard for them not to. But uh, you know, if you had, you could do something where you have like women operating in a different country who are the faces of your organizations, and then they have reporters who are down on the ground. Maybe it's just men in the in the countries that they're talking about who give them the stories, give them the video, um, and then you just have the women uh, who would be narrating over these stories, and it works perfectly. Okay, so you can operate. Um, you, you know, your, your, your people don't necessarily have to be too terribly organized to organize, and I know that sounds stupid when you say it, but that's the way hive mind DACs work. And then the final point here is that uh, if you are ignored, then your operation will simply grow. So if they attack you, you gain legitimacy be by them attacking you. Um, if they ignore you, then you grow, so either way you're going to end up winning. Now, where this gets super interesting, um, and this is actually something that I, as a miner, this when we were creating, or when I was working with the dev team who was going to create a version of Bitcoin to kill other, um, we'll call them altcoins, but other versions of Bitcoin, uh, this was actually what I wanted to eventually do, is... Um, have the uh, person media personalities running the mining operations um, because running a Bitcoin mining operation it's incredibly simple uh, the machines basically run by themselves you gotta you know maybe clean them out once every couple months that's basically it they rarely turn off you know there's rarely any problem with them um, the miners that I have I haven't had any problems with them the past month and a half um, you just gotta sort of be there in case something goes wrong right it's very simple to do um, and so you could teach this to media personalities within a couple of hours and so they could actually manage these operations um, because they require very little work and you wouldn't have to pay them a huge amount okay so the large scale scale mining operations that most people have they have to pay workers massive sums and this doesn't make any sense there's a couple positions within mining operations that you do need a professional the one is whoever runs uh, they call it a node and the node that your mining node processes all the information from your miners in the network that that's complex, but the actual people who manage the miners, that is not complex at all. So you can have media personalities that manage mining operations and create content. Because again, uh, with these mining operations, you can just have them behind some sort of window and they, like media personalities could be recording their shows while managing all these miners and actually being being able to know on the spot when something goes wrong with the miners, you know what I mean? Um, and so it, it's unbelievably easy to do and what this allows you to do is it gives you a um, constant income for your media personalities and because it's so simple and because again you would want to be using media personalities hopefully a lot of attractive women who would be able to attract uh, in the early stages before you become a legitimate operation they could attract their own donations and so uh, they've got this small this low paying constant income stream in addition to the donations that re they receive and they could actually make a living doing this pretty easily okay um, and the, the, the other point that you do is by have it paying these uh, lower wages to your media personalities, your mining operations are also more profitable than your competitors. And like I said before, if you want to create a white nationalist Bitcoin, you don't try to... Um, you know persuade the world that oh we're the best version of Bitcoin you go out you kill all other versions of Bitcoin so that you're the only one left okay by definition you're gonna have bad press with a white nationalist version of Bitcoin so you need to make sure that your mining operations are so profitable um, that there's absolutely nobody no way anyone can compete with you and this is one of the ways obviously the main way that you do it is through the improvement to Bitcoin by linking the block reward to the difficulty um, but through this method of paying lower wages to media personalities to manage manage your operations you uh, automatically give yourself um, an advantage uh, so that nobody can compete with you um, the final point that I want to say is it might require moving to Russia um, and the reason why I say it might require moving to Russia is because you want a place that has uh, low-cost electricity um, there's certain areas of Russia where the electricity you know you can get it for like two to three cents per kilowatt like you get it for insanely cheap amounts um, and this is uh, over large areas of Russia. The other thing that you want is you want a cold area because these miners give off heat. And if you're running massive operations, it actually gives off quite a bit of heat. Um, so you actually would want to move to Russia. Um, and, and again, this is only once it would be large scale and pretty successful. So that might be a negative 
some of these media personalities, but Russia is actually a great place. Um, if you've ever watched Rus Russian media, they um, they're very Christian. Um, they are very um, they give good press to uh, white people throughout the world. Uh, I would highly recommend watching Vesti News on YouTube. They've got some great series on what's going on in South Africa, and they don't fuck around with it. They're not big into political correctness. They're very much opposed to feminism. So Russian media is actually something you want to emulate, and if you do it right, uh, there's actually a good chance that you can uh, sort of get some types of state funding. They have, you know... Um, RT or whatever, Russia Today, uh, and that's a, an English-speaking Russian news station, and if you wanted to, uh, you could s become part of that. And the other thing that's good about moving to Russia and something like that is you can you can start building um, white ethno-states within Russia. For those of you who don't know, it's, it's a federation, um, and they've basically tried giving away massive parts of Russia within, like, Siberia, these cold areas that you actually want because they're competitive for mining with these low this low-cost electricity. Uh, they've tried giving a lot of this land away for free um, because nobody really wants to live there but if you have an actual uh, a business within these areas then you can start building uh, white civilization within Russia that way you have your own uh, you know it, it would be an ethno state within Russia but then if you want to use that as a base of operations to expand um, white nationalism throughout the world you absolutely could and again I've said this before I just said it a few minutes ago but um, Russia's trying to get um, uh, white South Africans to move to Russia uh, just for their own safety um, but that could be one way to start this is you start bringing people in from South Africa who again they're already not being paid that well but they're white people meaning they're willing to work hard and they're honest and so you can start bringing in white people from throughout the world give them their own homeland within Russia and then if you want to uh, you can move back because a lot of those South Africans they're very patriotic and they love South Africa and if you give them a, a base of operations within Russia you could end up moving back to South Africa and trying to retake it for the whites okay and you can do the same thing in America you can do it all over the place okay um, but anyways uh, I, this video ran a little bit long I hope uh, I explained it in a way that uh, newcomers can kind of understand but uh, like always there will be more videos coming out soon